I've put thousands of hours into vibe coding, everything from lovable to cursor to Claude code, from basic apps to AI systems that I actually use in real businesses. And through all of those projects, some principles have become 100% non-negotiables. If you don't know me, my name is Sean. I work with startups and my own businesses to implement these things every single day. And my goal on this channel is to bring you real boots on the ground insights from what works and what doesn't. So if you want to build actual apps or automations or workflows that work, these are the principles you need to follow. So number one, committing changes like your sanity depends on it because it does. Look, vibe coding can get out of hand pretty quickly. Like all of a sudden on a dime, the system goes out and does something that completely breaks an important piece of what you had going on. And sometimes it does not revert out of those changes correctly, which means if you do not have a save point, you will be completely screwed. So there's a few helpful things to start with. First things first, anytime you start work on a new major feature, you want to create a branch for that feature. Now the command that is gonna allow you to do this is this git checkout dash B, and then the name of the branch. I like to name my branches if I'm building a feature, feature slash whatever the feature name is. And so if I hit enter, this is going to create a new branch called feature slash YouTube example in this case. Now this is great because you can then experiment with anything in your project without worry that it's gonna mess up what you had going on in that main core of your app. Now imagine a scenario where three commits earlier, we made some really important bug fix to our system, but now that bug has been reintroduced later on in the app, and we don't remember the exact steps the system went through to fix it. And we get caught in this death loop of trying to fix that problem, and it doesn't know how to fix it this time. Well, now it's not a problem because we can instruct Claude or Cursor to go back and perform a git diff, meaning it can go back in time and look at the state of those files in the two different applications and determine what was working before and what it needs to change now. So this one alone is a complete lifesaver. But how do we help avoid the situation altogether where it's even going back and breaking stuff that we had already made a fix for in the first place? Well, that is where our next commandment comes into play, becoming a memory file power user. So most modern coding agents at this point in time have a system for creating memory files that you can reference every single time you make a request to the model. Now, one of the pieces of that build is that I was using a library called GraphQL to make requests from my front end to my back end. Now, the only problem was that as we were building and building and building on top of this system, it kept making this change anytime it wanted to create a new API endpoint where it could not fetch the identity of the user making the request. It could not find the authenticated user. And so it would get stuck in this death loop where it would break a fundamentally working feature inside of the app, not know how to use the function that I already had in place for it to work, and then it would just break and break and break and not know how to fix the problem. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like. Inside of my project, I have this file which gets the current user and makes sure they are authenticated. If the user is not authenticated, then it's pretty simple. They can't make the request that they want to make, right? So we're making sure that only an authenticated or authorized user can make that request. So sounds pretty simple, but the issue is that anytime we created a new API endpoint that needed to use this function, it would break and it wouldn't know how to use the function. So first it would start off with, hey, the app isn't actually building properly and I can't use it. Then I would go into Claude code or cursor and try to actually debug what was going on. And the solution wasn't to fix the bug, it was to fundamentally change the function and how it worked, which would break every other piece of my app. And that was becoming a huge pain in the ass and it was losing me hours in my process. So the solution was to fix that by adding in a memory about how to handle GraphQL requests in the future. Now there's a few things I added in here that specifically helped. Number one, anytime the front end makes a request to the back end, check if there's already an existing query to do that. Number two, Anytime we are making a request, make sure that the front end is mutating properly and it matches what the back end is expecting to see. And number three, the one that really did it, anytime you start building a new endpoint, you absolutely must reference similar endpoints to understand the patterns that already work inside the app. The moment I added this into this memory file, 
that bug ceased to be. It never made that mistake again. And so this is huge because again, the moment I added that into the file, I never ran into that issue again. I was spending hours debugging this stupid authentication stuff when what I wanted to be doing was building all of the cool features of the app that the user is gonna actually see and interact with. But this actually leads me to the next commandment, which is one of the most important ones, because I had to be aware of the fact that that was happening in the first place. So commandment number three is building intuition around when you need to actually sit there and look at the stream of thought coming out of your coding tool. Because here's the thing, vibe coding does not equal mindlessness and just accepting anything that pops out of the system. You should build a habit of thinking like an orchestrator because knowing what you are building is what will take you to the next level and allow you to outperform 99% of the other vibe coders out there. I view vibe coding as one of the next great learning evolutions. Because if you're paying attention, you don't just avoid these one-off problems like the one I'm about to show you, but you start building knowledge and context around how to actually build these things. What does it mean to build a robust solution to something that is going to operate in the real world? So if we go back to this example of creating this password security system update, I think what a lot of people are going to do is just see this output about everything it changed and say, okay, cool, on to the next chat, right? And you just, you're away from that thing immediately. You don't go through and commit the change. You just, hey, I'm on to the next thing. But what you really need to do is build a habit for thinking about and reading the actual outputs of these things. They'll take you a few extra minutes in your process, but you're going to start to build a real understanding and you're also going to catch things that it does that you don't want it to do. So again, in the real world context, in that get current user function that I showed you, I was reading the outputs from Claude code. And I noticed that every single time it went through and said that it needed to modify that file, which was already working, anytime it modified that function for what it thought it needed to do, the entire app's authentication would break. I would get booted out all of the screens that I was in. I'd have to like flush everything out of the system and revert the change. It was a total pain in the ass. But the only reason that I caught that that was specifically what kept breaking my app is that I was actually reading the outputs from the system, right? I was reading the chain of thought of what it was saying was breaking, noticing what file or what function it kept trying to change, and then telling it, don't change that anymore. You're doing me dirty. This is actually another reason why Claude Code's planning mode or any model's planning mode is a huge level up also to use because it allows you to catch certain things like that before it even gets implemented in the first place. So if you genuinely want to become great at this stuff, you absolutely have to start doing this. It really is a non-negotiable because it not only helps you in that moment, but it helps you build contingency workflows, automations, and systems to continuously get better and better and better. That's part of the reason that the next commandment up is self-documenting loops. So one of the worst things that you can do in your project is to build something that you do not know what it is or how it works or all of the files that are actually involved with that feature working. Because here's the thing with these tools that you will realize when you use them enough. It's not uncommon for them to build features, but not actually hook up all of the advanced functionality that it made for those features. So it will sometimes build something advanced but fall short or take shortcuts on actually implementing it. And the only reason I caught this is because I asked the system to document all of the files that were used in that feature, what it created and where they hooked together. And it basically told me in that feature documentation, hey, yeah, we built all these other things too, but they're actually not hooked in yet. Do you want me to hook those in for you right now? So this one has a simple mode and an advanced mode that you can implement. If you're in a tool like Cursor, you can simply come through here and give it that instruction. So you can say, look through the user onboarding feature and document how it works. The level of detail should be similar to that found in this file where I had already done it with Claude code. And I can say go, and now it's gonna go out and it's gonna build the feature documentation around that onboarding feature. Now, if you're in a tool like Claude code, for example, you can maybe use hooks or you could use a customized agent that sole purpose is to go through and document features after a new feature is built. And you can actually configure it to invoke that thing manually so that the moment it finishes a new feature, it goes through and it documents how the feature works. Either way, whether it's the basic mode or the advanced mode, it's something you should be doing. Let's take a look at what this file looks like. So now we can see we got a similar level of documentation for 
our user onboarding flow, okay? Now, this is a different model. This is using uh, GPT-5 because I thought, why not just use that right now? It's obviously not as much in depth, but hey, this isn't a video about the shortcomings of GPT-5. Again, this is one of those things where you need to realize that these tools can build so fast, they can outpace your ability to understand and retain what is being built, right? If you're actually a software engineer that was in there creating all of these files and all of these functions by hand, you're going to remember the different parts of the code base, where the files live, what they connect to, because you were there, right? You did it. If we're not doing that, we need to make sure we have backup systems in place to help us retain the different things we're building, why we built them, and how they function. So this helps us make sure that we're not building steamy piles of shit that don't actually work the way we wanted it to. But speaking of steamy piles of shit, the next commandment is realizing that a lot of the time, these models are in fact shit-making machines. So when your context gets big, your project gets big, these tools will often go off the rails. And so it's often easier to actually just start over on a new task. And so all we need to do is copy that ID. We can pop back in here and then just do git checkout, paste in that ID. And now we have switched back to the point in time where this thing actually was. So commandment number six is, in my opinion, an absolute non-negotiable for vibe coders, especially, especially if you do not come from the world of software engineering. And that is adopting a three loop planning cycle before you ever write a line of code. So a lot of vibe coding starts with a very simple idea. Like you're going throughout the course of your day-to-day -day life, you stumble upon some thought or some idea and you're like, man, I could build an app for this. Other people would surely pay for it if I would pay for it. Now that's awesome. That's where a lot of great things begin. But that is not enough context to actually build something. So we want to flesh out our context as best as possible so that the system can take the plan and actually do something with it that matches our expectation of what we wanted in the first place. So I have an entire video on my five non-negotiable prompts that every vibe coder should use. I will link it somewhere around this video. So right now I want to show you the first three prompts because they are specifically my planning prompts. So I use these as Claude code agents, but you can use these also as prompts. They also work very well just as prompts in any system. So prompt number one is our product manager. And this is the one you want to start with. This is where we're taking that raw idea that you have for something and we're turning it into like a structured plan. What are the different types of user personas that might actually use this thing? How are they going to use it, right? How do they interact with the app? And what are we putting in the MVP versus what is going in the feature backlog, right? So we need to have a really clear understanding out of the gate of what specifically are we going to build because this is gonna get funneled into our next prompt. Now, again, I've done entire videos on these, so I'm not gonna go super far in depth into this, but it's really a brainstorming exercise where we want to build an executive summary like an elevator pitch of what this thing actually is and the core problem that it's actually going to solve for people. After we've done that, we want to build all of those user stories or like those ideas for the features that we have into concrete feature specifications. I don't want to just take my idea of, hey, it's a recipe app that people can use AI with and then just go throw that into Lovable and let it go build something, right? I'm not going to get anything out of it because it doesn't know what I wanted in the first place. And so in this product manager exercise, we are fleshing out what exactly am I going to build? And so we're going through every single feature that is involved in this, and we're making sure it's super well fleshed out. We then repeat that same fundamental premise. It's going to actually pull those features through from the outputs of the UX engineer and the knowledge of what the backend endpoints are. So those first three pieces of that loop, the product manager, the UX engineer, and the system architect, are pretty much non-negotiables. So I don't care if you're using Lovable or you're using a future iteration of Claude code 99, you should be implementing a planning process. And in my opinion, these three stages specifically set a really strong foundation for you to succeed. So these commandments are what separates the tinkerers from people that can actually build real stuff with these tools. So master these fundamentals now so that you can be in the top 1% of people that are building really cool solutions to real concrete problems. So which commandment hit you hardest? Let me know in the comments below. I actually love to read the comments and it often is fuel 
for future video ideas. So let me know. But that is it for this video. I will see you in the next one.